welcome to our meetup. We're usually stationed in, in Zurich and Bern, so it's really nice to see um, so many people from all over the world here. <laughs> um, just maybe to a sentence about us. We're um, Fiona, Lara, and Tam. We're from Zurich, uh, Schaffhausen, and Bern, so um, in the small country of Switzerland. We found each other like maybe a year, maybe a little bit more, a year and a half ago. Um, we all, we're all some sort of UX enthusiasts. Um, <laughs> I don't think any of us actually works as a, as a UX writer per se at the moment, but um, yeah, we all um, found each other with our you know, interest and enthusiasm for UX writing. Um, yeah, and today we're having a really special um, session because as you all know, Tori Podmajerski is here for us. Um, Tori is stationed in Seattle. So it's 10 a.m. for her this morning. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, quickly before we get to what your talk will be about, Tori, um, just a few administrative things. Um, first of all, just so everybody knows, we will be recording this session. Um, so we'll be recording the session and we'll be uploading it to YouTube afterwards. So in case you didn't, don't like uh, you know, your face being on, on YouTube, please just um, turn off your camera. Um, throughout the talk, uh, please use the chat to ask and, and share any questions that you might have. So Lara, Tam and I will be monitoring the chat. Um, we'll collect all your questions and we'll hit you with them in the end, Tori. <laughs> um, yeah, so please use the chat for that. What else? Um, right, so our, our meetup, um, <laughs> we're always looking for speakers and sponsors. In case you think you might have a topic that you would like to talk about, or maybe you have a topic that you don't know anything about and would like somebody to give a talk about, please let us know. Um, we'd love to hear from you anytime. We're on LinkedIn. You can also message us on, on the meetup page. Um, yeah, so quick look out for after Tori's talk and after the Q&A session with her. We'll be hosting this, we usually host this little speed networking event. So um, for those of you who would like to stay, it's absolutely not mandatory. You can stay afterwards and we'll send you out into breakout rooms of maybe four to five people so that you can you know, get to, get to know each other, talk to each other there a little bit. We feel like this, this whole networking part um, of the meetups is getting lost, which is why, yeah, we tend to do, do this in the end. All right. Um, I think now if everybody is more or less settled in, um, I'd probably already hand over to you, Tori. Um, so Tori, I don't think you need a, a big introduction. Do you're, uh, you're, everybody who, who works in UX writing or knows a little bit about it, then they know your name. Um, and today, I mean, Tori gave us like, a, I don't know, like 12 topics to choose from um, for a talk that she would be, she would be yeah, she would be doing. And uh, we chose three topics, measuring UX writing, uh, measuring with heuristics, and your own personal you know, process for UX writing. How do you start? How do you go on um, Yeah, with, with UX writing in your daily life? So thank you for being here. And I'll, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you, Tori. Well, thank you so much, Fiona and Lara and Tam, for having me here. I am really excited to be joining you all in all of our different time zones and different places we are. I'm coming to you from Seattle, as Fiona mentioned. Um, I am the author of the Strategic Writing for UX book. Um, and the most popular stuff that people want to hear about is this measurement, like how do we know if it's good? That's, that's like the big deal. How do we know like we can use words, right? Like we can all use words, but how do we know when they're the right words? How do we know if they're any good? So that is really what we're gonna get into today. So we're gonna talk about measuring UX writing directly. We're gonna talk about um, the heuristics for UX writing uh, when you can't measure directly, especially. And we're gonna talk about, um, well, first I'm gonna get my notes so that I can see them so that I don't like totally stumble. Hmm. Um, and we're going to uh, talk about my UX writing process, as Fiona mentioned. I also hope that we'll have time for just a little bit of putting it all together and seeing the impact that that makes. So in order to get to your questions as soon as possible, I'm going to just dig in. Let's talk about measuring UX writing directly. 
the, uh, the Zoom window is really, it loves having the space. Okay, so in order to talk about measuring UX writing, let's just briefly take a whirlwind tour through what are all of the different kinds of content, like so that we know what we are measuring. So here's the very basics of what a business is trying to do, a business that makes experiences or an organization that makes experiences. They're trying to attract customers, convert them into users of it, onboard them so they're successful in that experience, engage them in that experience, hopefully keep them there for a while. If anything breaks, they want to support them. And they frequently want to transform this person, each person, into somebody who will keep coming back for the next new experience uh, and bring their friends and family and coworkers and everybody else so that they are attracting people into it again. They want it to be a virtuous cycle. But what the people are actually trying to do is not the same as what the business is trying to do. Like while the business is being attracty, you're being, you're investigating. You want to verify. You might have a moment of commitment and then you're going to set it up. You're going to use it. If something breaks, you'll fix it, et cetera. And for all of these things, there's different kinds of content we make. There's this sort of uh, marketing and advertising that raises awareness. There's endorsements and reviews and product collateral that helps people make that buy or commitment decision or even just a download. But then there's the get started guides, the setup experiences, those first run experiences and the how-to content that gets people going and all the titles and buttons and descriptions. That's sort of really what we think of as UX writing, right? From the alerts and the, the, you know, the labels, the questions that it might ask. But there's also the game and experience content. Like if there is a game narrative, it would be in this using part. If there is, you know, clever descriptions of beautiful dishes that the chef will prepare for you, that's where this will appear. There's also troubleshooting and error messages and alerts that show up. Then there's badges and profile ratings. There may be conferences that help support these things. So really the TLDR is that there is a huge amount of content that is created. And this talk is not about most of it. This talk is about this bottom half, about the UX content, the content for using. So when we go to measure that content, what we really wanna do is get into these get started guides, the titles, buttons, and descriptions, these error messages and alerts. But then what will we be measuring about it? What is important to measure when somebody is in the experience? So this is an example app uh, that we'll use to, to talk about this measurement. So if you, you've seen, uh, if you've read my book, you've seen a lot about TAP. TAP is a totally fictional made up transit application that if you want to ride a bus for wherever TAP is, you go into this and you can search for a, a route. You can also buy a bus pass and uh, use it, use a QR code to get scanned in and pay. So what we need to think about when we are thinking about measuring is what are the goals of the people using it? Well, they want to get where they're going. They want to get to their destination. They also want to pay as little as possible to do that. They want to pay the minimum. They want it to be convenient. And they want to travel as efficiently as possible. If there's one bus, they want to take that one bus. They don't want to take those three buses with two transfers that go in a different neighborhood. Sure. But then what are the organization goals? Well, the organization wants to use information that it gathers from the app to plan their bus routes, to maintain their funding, to keep their costs low by just by centralizing these things. And they want to have high ridership. Right? Like they don't want empty buses traveling around their region. So where these two goals, sets of goals come together are in what I call the key behaviors. They're often called, uh, and at Google, we call them um, critical user journeys. Oh, and I will say, now that I've mentioned Google, I work for Google and I am not speaking for them in this talk. Um, so these key behaviors also known as critical user journeys, are searching for the route. So when a person searches for the route, they're gonna to get to their destination and travel as efficiently as possible. 
and tap will know, hey, people like these roots. We're going to plan for uh, to maintain ridership there. We're going to make sure there's enough buses there. They want to buy bus passes, right? That is a place where these goals come together as well. And also paying the fare in the app. So let's get into how we use these key behaviors to do measuring. The first kind of measuring we're going to talk about is at this part in the cycle, the onboarding. We're going to say how many, um, we're going to say what is the average time it takes for people to start doing these key behaviors from the point of committing or downloading the app to doing their first search, right? Searching for a route or paying for a bus pass. How long does it take them to do their first one? Or how long does it take them to do all of them, right? By measuring the time it takes to onboard them before these people are doing the, the behaviors that meet their goals and meet TAP's goals, we get this sense of, hey, this seems to be working or doesn't seem to be working as well. So when people are downloading it, but never searching for a bus route or never paying for a bus pass or never paying their fare, then we have a way in with the content and we say, hey, can we improve a get started guide or a first run experience? Like this is a downloadable app. There's probably no guide that comes with it. But there's probably a first run experience where we have somebody come up on the screen and tell them, hey, to get started right away, do this. Great. So if we can create these experiences with content and our design partners and product partners, et cetera, to get them in and get them going, we're going to improve this onboarding metric. So let's say onboarding is not our problem. It's actually engagement. People have it, they've done the first thing and then they never come back. Or they do it once in a while, but it is not regular and we get more drop off than consistency. The, uh, the way that businesses tend to measure this is daily active users or monthly active users, depending on the way we do this. So this is the number of people who are active in the experience. It, when there are problems in the experience with engagement, the ways that content can make improvements are in the titles and buttons and descriptions, also in that game and experience content. And when we do that, when we make the changes there, which are in general the least expensive engineering changes to make, then we can say, hey, it works better for people. People stay longer. People are more active when we change the content in this way versus this way. And sometimes that means A-B testing, right? Some companies are set up so that they can run simultaneously two different versions with two different sets of content. Many companies, though, are not set up for that. Uh, and so you can do sometimes uh, similar things where it's, you know, we're going to do this for 30 days and then this for the next 30 days. But you can see already that in the case of like a, a transit app, that's going to be different from one month to another, right? Like, is there a popular local festival in one month and not the other? You're gonna have a lot of changes uh, due to that. So continuing on the engagement, are people completing the key behavior? So not just are they active in these key behaviors and in those screens, but are they completing them, right? So in a, in a shopping app, this might mean the, actually purchase completion and getting their item. In the, the TAP app, it's a lot more about the, um, are they riding the bus? Did they search for a route and then later pay uh, the fare with the app uh, on a bus going on that route? Great. And if we are not having that completion, then we can think about alerts like, hey, the next bus in your area that you just searched for and bought a bus pass, the next bus is coming up right now or in 10 minutes and alert people to that. And we can measure the effect of, you know, we can say, what is the completion without alerts like that? And we can say, what is completion with alerts like that? Of course, this would be different in very different kinds of experiences. This is just an example with this fictional tap app. So we also have, you know, past completion, we also have retention, right? So if engagement can be people per day, 
then retention is really days per person. Are people long-term users of this? Does the average user download it and then use it for month after month? Are they commuters, right? Or are they uh, just making sure they have a bus pass and occasionally using it? Great. So lots of organizations making experiences want people to come back to those experiences over and over again. And retention is how we do that. Now, a lot of these things, like if it's just people's usage, like I am i don't care what the app tells me, if I don't need to ride the bus, none of that is going to keep me. But if it breaks for me, if it wouldn't accept my payment method, if it wouldn't um, if it didn't scan right when I got on the bus, if I got embarrassed by that, none of this is going to help me and I'm going to stop using this app. So having that content uh, be there and be useful to me is important and we can measure changes in retention based on error messages and troubleshooting there. And then just one last way, we can help people who prefer the app bring other people into the fold. We can help them champion it. Um, and a big way we do that is with referrals and badges. Like if you, I don't know how many of you experienced Foursquare where you could earn badges and be like the, the king of a coffee shop or something because you went there so often and kept checking in. But people would brag about these like, I'm the king of my coffee shop, oh yeah. So having those badges, having those profile ratings, like I'm a, I'm a million mile rider on my bus. Oh yeah, gosh, that would be a lot of bus rides. But uh, having those, that kind of content in there and having pre-programmed text messages that we can send to our friends and relations like, oh, you don't use the TAP app? Let me just refer you let me just send you a text so it'll take you right to the right place in the store, make it super easy to download the app and have it right in there. Great. And we're gonna do those text messages with text for the most part. All of this is content that UX writers can affect. So those are all ways to directly measure. And you may have noticed, this is not just measuring the UX content, this is measuring the UX. This is ways that we should all be looking at our user experiences and saying, is this working for people? What can we change in order to make this better? What I've highlighted here are just the categories of content we might be able to change for that. So in the vein of categories, let's go to even bigger categories and talk about heuristics. So in heuristics, we're really talking about the rules for UX writing, independent of being able to test things right in the moment. So these are just things we know about. Uh, and I'm gonna break them into two categories, voice and usability. We really want our voice to be consistent and recognizable. Like when you open that tap app or when you open Facebook or when you open Open Table, I don't know, other apps, you want it to be recognizable. When you get a notification from them, you want, it, you want to be able to recognize, oh yeah, that came from this experience, that came from this brand. And there's really only a few things that we can do with our voice. And it's the concepts. The concepts are the things that we talk about, right? You don't expect your banking app to start talking to you about great dinner recipes. I would find that a little weird at least. So it's the things that you talk about. It's the words that you choose to use, the vocabulary that land those concepts and really land the principles, which we'll talk about in a moment. There's verbosity, like how many words are you using to say any given thing? There's also the grammar. Are you keeping it simple and informal? Are you keeping it complex and more formal? Are you keeping it uh, edgy? Are you using grammars that are specific to a particular culture or region? Those are all choices you can make. And then punctuation and capitalization are things that we have a lot of flexibility with in English and no flexibility with in say Chinese for capitalization, capitals don't exist. Um, and punctuation have, uh, has much stricter rules in some languages than in others. Um, 
writing primarily in English, I got no rules. Um, all we have are basic guidelines for this will be more effective or less effective. So let me show you how I put these together for a company I worked with called OfferUp. So at OfferUp, I came in, it's a startup, it's a marketplace company um, uh, based here in uh, the Seattle region. And when I came in, the marketing team and the executives, my cat is bumping against my leg. So I'm a little distracted. Uh, the marketing company had come in, uh, uh, or sorry, the marketing department had established, here are our product principles. And those are along the top of this slide. They're simple, trustworthy, personal, neighborly, and gratifying. And that's really how we wanted the product to feel to the people using it. It should feel all of these things. But what they hadn't done is say, well, how do we land this? And I came in and I was the only UX writer, only content strategist for this uh, more than 100 person company. And they said, well, how do we, you know, we have these principles, how, do you, how are they gonna show up in the content? And I said, let me make a chart. And what I did is I said, here's the six things I can change the content vocabulary, and I called it uh, content then, I've been calling it concepts since, um, because that's a lot clearer to people, uh, verbosity, grammar, capitalization and punctuation. And I lined up to each of these principles. And I said, in order to be trustworthy, we're going to be empathetic, we're gonna be direct, we're gonna be transparent about what's going on with them. Like we're not gonna um, dodge the question if something bad has happened. Uh, in the concepts, we're going to talk about those concepts. But if you go down to the, the grammar, I say it should be asterisk free. And the putting asterisks after things like, we're making a promise. No, we're taking that promise away. You know, as soon as you follow that asterisk, we're just, we're going to take that away. And I said, we've got to not only stop doing that, we can't do that going forward because that is a way that we're breaking this brand principle. And you know, compare that to the neighborly. Uh, well, actually the trustworthy also includes brief, right? Because if you can't say it uh, transparently and in a brief way, you're probably making stuff up too. At least that's how it tends to feel. So if it's neighborly though, we want to include personal and community details. We have permission if we are trying to amplify the neighborliness to include more information than we do in the trustworthiness. So while these all apply to the product as a whole, for any given screen or notification or moment in the app, some of these principles will apply more strongly than others. And those are design decisions that we have to make. And it also, using this then helps me spread out and be like, well, for this notification that we really want to be about the personal and the trustworthy, let me see if I can amp on one of those for a couple of options, uh, each one for a couple of options. And then, you know, can I include uh, all of these in one? Where are the trade-offs I need to make? So that is how I've attacked voice. Um, let's talk about usability. For usability heuristics, I really want to talk about these five categories. I want to talk about accessibility, purposefulness, concision, conversationality, and clarity. Um, and I'm just going to go through them with my most basic rule set. Now, for accessible, this is not the all of the things you need to do for accessibility in an experience. This is about how do we make it usable how do we make the UX content usable? What are the, the just key things we've got to do even before we're sure that it's hooked up in all of the right technological ways to use assistive tools? So we want to make sure that it's available in the languages that the people who are using it can use, right? So if we are making it in, I don't know, is it even possible in Switzerland to launch an app in just one language? It seems <laughs> Fiona is gesturing, no, not possible. In the US, it is actually sadly very common for apps to be launched in English long before they're launched in any other language. 
And when you think about the wide range of English profi proficiency in the population, that's appalling. And then we're taking those numbers as like, oh, well, this is, you know, the US population and we're only reaching this percentage of them weight. Maybe it's because they don't, this isn't accessible to them. We also want to keep the reading level below seventh grade for general, and I mean well below seventh grade for general uh, or 10th grade for, for professional. In, in general, the lower the reading level, the more usable this will be. And by reading level, I mean um, for English, there's a variety of academic measures that are used um, based on word length, based on syllable count, based on length of sentence and, and a number of other measures. Sometimes some of them use common words um, and you know, frequency of common words uh, in there to say, how, how easy is this to use based on reading level? It is a reading level is differently available in different languages. So your mileage may vary, um, but for English, it's pretty solid. Uh, and then also for accessible, every element on the screen, every element that we are using to convey information or for people to interact with needs to have text that screen readers speak and needs to have text that is differentiated and understandable when the screen reader speaks it. So that's accessible, purposeful. What the person should do or can do to meet their goals is clear. Like it, the experience they are looking at should reflect back to them like, yeah, I'm going to get to buy my bus pass here. Or yeah, this is working for me here. It should also reflect the company's goals or the organization's goals, at least to the level that, the, that would be reasonable for the person to understand, right? Like it would be reasonable for TAP to say, um, when you search for routes and ride on them, we know to prioritize uh, it's added to our data to prioritize it for funding. Great. That would encourage ridership. It would demonstrate that the, the organization has its purposes and why it's out there. So purposeful is pretty easy. Like it's, it's an easy concept to get. And then you start looking at different apps with that lens and you're like, what am I even supposed to do here? And what does the company get out of it? So purposeful. Let's talk about concise. This is really very mechanical and this is true for English. Uh, I do not know these numbers for other languages, but for English on many different sizes of screens from TVs to mobile devices to desktop computers uh, to laptops, buttons should have three or fewer words. And really three words don't work particularly well unless two of them are commonly used together as a single phrase so that people's English reading brains recognize them as like, that's one concept and another, great, I know what I'm doing here. So buttons, very short. Text, like blocks of text, should be less than 50 characters wide and less than four lines long. It's not that people can't read it, it's that they don't. And I don't know if this is something endemic to the English language. I don't know if that if it's somebody something about uh, American audiences and how we've been trained when using computers that if it's a big block of text, nobody expects me to read it anyway. So why would I? We don't know the psychology behind it, but we can say that this is held up in many different studies across many different kinds of uh, experiences where when we make it shorter than that, people actually might respond to it. Um, and then the other part about concision is, is it relevant? And is it relevant in a recognizable way to that user at that moment? If it's relevant to them and they have no way to know that, then you're just putting a wall of text in front of them. Man, you don't want that. They need to know it's relevant to them. Conversational is something that um, I wish I had a different word for, but what I really want here is not conversational like the casual style. This is not a style thing. This is about how humans, when we interact with anything, it's in conversation. And so these, uh, this category of usability is all about respecting that 
humans operate by being in conversation with things. So we wanna make sure that the words and phrases and ideas we're using are familiar to the other person, right? When we are in a respectful conversation uh, about what we do for work, we talk about it differently with somebody in the same industry versus somebody um, who is that aunt who we hardly ever see who never works in computers. We talk about it differently. We respect the audiences we're with and we speak about it appropriately. Um, and we also, when we are giving directions or presenting stepwise processes or experiences, we do those in useful steps in a logical order because there is a sequence to conversation and we need to respect that there is sequentiality. There is, um, if you wanna go deeper into those kinds of rules, look up Grace's maxims, they're the best. So let's talk about clarity. Clarity is all about in an experience, the actions have unambiguous results. So sometimes that's done with a spinner or a something. And with that spinner or something, then we should always have text that a screen reader can read so that somebody using it without vision also knows that something is happening. Also, we tend to use text with this, right? Like file uploaded, for example, after you have uploaded a file. We should also make this how-to and policy information really easy to find. Whether or not people click on it, there is an increased sense of clarity when we provide it, when we provide access to it. We should also make sure that our error messages either help them go forward or make it clear they can't go forward because the name of that error inside the backend software is less useful to the end user than it was to the coder. Um, and it needs to help them uh, get there. And then finally about terminology, the same term in an experience needs to mean the same concept each time it's used. And for a concept that has a term associated with it, um, don't, uh, whenever you use that concept, use the same term. So it works both ways there. Okay. That was our whirlwind tour of measurement and then heuristics. Let's talk about what that looks like in process. Well, oh, Laura, thank you for putting up crisis maxims. Excellent. Okay, so process can look like this. This was uh, my team, my designer, my backend program manager, my frontend program manager, and my um, design producer all looking at a set of cards that are actually slips of paper that I used mail merge to take from a giant spreadsheet of all the possible settings that existed in Xbox 360 and existed on xbox.com so that we, when we were building the new experience for Xbox One, we could start with the information architecture that made the most sense. So sometimes this is what it looks like getting the experts in the space, preparing them with all the right content. Like maybe it's not all written yet, but these are the right ideas. These are the right concepts that we need to talk about and need to be in categories that will need names so that people can get through them. And, and this is how we did it. And honestly, with very few changes to those categories, that is what we shipped. Um, we did an awful lot of in-home testing of these. We did an awful lot of rewriting of them. And one of them, the, the category sign-in security and pass key, we all thought wouldn't work at all. We were, I was down to my just last brain cell going, I don't know what to call it. I know all these things should be together. All of our studies say these things should be together. Wah, but people need to find them all. And it tested beautifully. Nobody ever had any questions. Nobody felt awkward about it, except all of us going like, it wraps onto two lines, none of the rest of them. Oh God, it's terrible. And yet it worked. So sometimes that's what it looks like when you start from the very beginning. Sometimes you're not starting from the very beginning and you're getting a screenshot from an executive with commentary on it saying, what the heck is this error message? Ah, so this doesn't follow any of our heuristic principles, except for maybe concision. 
but it definitely doesn't provide that clarity of what to do next. It isn't in the voice of the product. Um, it doesn't, this one doesn't follow the, the voice rules for that product at all. So here is what I do for um, emergent requests. I use text boxes and I blank stuff out and I put stuff on top of it because I do not want anybody uh, evaluating a string inside a Slack message or inside an email. Because if they're evaluating it in a spreadsheet, if they're evaluating it outside of the context, they've got no way to say, how does that make the person feel? How does it work for that person? So I put text boxes over it and I rewrite it, right? And this, for this kind of like encountered an exception, like we don't actually know what happened, but I'm still trying to move them forward, try again. So here's what ends up happening, that single example, single screen. But when I'm, uh, when I'm iterating on work, it tends to get longer as I make it more purposeful. And then I try to make it concise. And then it gets like super hella robotic. And then I work on making it conversational and clear. And frankly, I make it look really linear here. I'm pretty much doing all of these things all at once. But the first thing I almost always do is start with purpose. What does this need to do for the user and for the company? What action do we need them to take? So um, here's what that looks like. And I'm gonna go through these way too fast to read, but I'm gonna start like, say I have to start with this notification, like your payment method has expired. We want them to be able to pay their fare without being embarrassed, update their payment method. We wanna maintain our positive relationship with these uh, tap writers. And we have these voice concepts that are defined for this fictional app of wasting no resource, every ride on time, and rides for every rider. I'm not sure how those are gonna fit in here yet, but we'll keep them there. And then I'm gonna work on purpose. And they get longer and longer. Save money and hassle by updating your payment method. Nobody wants to read that on their the home screen. And then I'm going to take the best of those that has the most of the purposes in them. And I'm going to start again, and I'm going to make it more concise. I'm just going to say, how can I say that more briefly and more briefly? And honestly, my Figma files are full of these iteration and iteration. I tend, like I try to get to a point that makes sense and then make a copy and keep going, right? I don't want to just have the one polished pearl of wisdom. No, because I'm going to have forgotten something. I'm, I'm not the only person working on this experience. I'm going to take the best of these concise ones, which is not like, it's frequently not the shortest one. And I'm going to say, okay, let's make it more conversational. How can I more appropriately uh, respond to this? I'm going to take the best of those. And that gives me all of this set that I can look at and say, what are the best ones here? And I'm going to say, hey, content team or feature team, the original message doesn't follow our voice and really doesn't meet our purpose. Here's the option I recommend and maybe why. And then here's another couple of options. What do you think? In general, I often have the team come back to me and be like, oh, we forgot to talk about this whole other purpose that we were hoping would happen. And then I have a starting place and sometimes we can work that in too. So let's put it all together. When working on the measurement, when working on the, the when we have the heuristics together, um, here, is, here is a process. So um, I told you about offer up earlier, the marketplace that I had the voice chart for. When, so this is a marketplace in which people post items they wanna sell and then people can find those items and then they meet together in person and exchange the item and the money. So in a vanishingly small number of cases, like an incredibly few number of cases, somebody shows up without the money and just wants to steal the object or somebody shows up without the object and wants to steal the money. Um, that's not good, but we had a system inside OfferUp 
for to report the person because from a product perspective we want to be able to kick these bad actors off the platform so they could report somebody who had done them harm and we say oh why do you want to report them and then what we wanted them to do in case of a crime was choose incident at meetup and then one of these they took my item i was hurt or other something like that so when i first came into the company this already existed and i looked at it and i said how is this working for you hey operations team is this giving you the data you need and it was not um, and it was people were choosing um, other options instead of incident at meetup um, and then reporting a crime there so it was hard for us to find these ones that were the most important for us to respond to um, and we had to sift through all of the other data and they would frequently just choose other on the first screen or other here, which gave us really not a lot to go on. So I did some studies. I tested six iterations of two different hierarchies uh, for the item and for person, because you could also report an item. And I asked people to report in this user testing 20 hypothetical bad behaviors, like you did this and this thing happened, how would you report it? And they would choose through the flow. And then they were asked about trustworthiness, safety, and likelihood of using the app. So we wanted to make sure that any changes we were making here didn't scare people off. So when I changed these from, um, and actually let me just highlight here, most of these started with the same word. So it was already hard for people to just differentiate among list items. And when, uh, when they wanted to report something bad happened, incident is a low usage word in English. Like it's hard to recognize, especially when they're in a heightened emotional state. Oh, heavens. And then they got here and there was not even one for, they took my money. There was, they took my item, there's, I was hurt. So I had dug into a bunch of our reporting that we thought should be in this category. And I made a lot of changes. So this was our best tested one, where the, the top reason people re would report each other is for standing each other up, for not going to the meeting, but making a low, low offer, being rude. We wanted trouble at meetup and that people were like, yes, we were at the meetup and there was trouble. And this uh, significantly expanded. It was unsafe location. I was injured. They took my item or money because to us working you know, to determine if we needed to work with law enforcement, that was the same category to us. Um, and this improved accuracy by double digit percentages. It improved sentiment across the board with double digit uh, improvements. And it saved us money on our operations side because our agents uh, could spend less time sifting through these things. So that's the kind of impact we could make. Now, what kind of questions do y'all have? Well, first of all, I think that's like a round of some <laughs> applause of all of us. Thank you so much, Tori. That was um, amazing. We just were getting a few comments. So I just wanna say that it was amazing applause. So thank you. Yay, um, thank you. Second of all, um, I've been checking all the questions that came in and the most important one was, um, Tori, what's your cat's name? <laughs> oh, that's Juniper, and she did go yeah. lay down and um, uh, go to her cat bed over here, so. <laughs> She's all settled, all right. It's all settled, yep, <laughs> very important. Cool, um, so we've been getting um, a lot of questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pick out a few that we think, yeah, will, will be the most interesting. First one from um, Benny, he's asking, um, I'm curious if you also get a say in the marketing content. And if yes, are you and are the team applying the same voice there as in the product itself? Yeah, so the voice, um, so at OfferUp, we definitely use the same voice um, because the marketing department was like, oh, this is great. I mean, we were a startup, so it's not like we were all staffed with, with great resources there. Mm -hmm. um, in my current products, like my, I currently work in Google on support systems. 
We don't market our support systems. When you need help with Google, you go to Google support. Um, so I don't currently work with, with marketing. And in my, uh, in my experience, the relationship with marketing really depends on so many factors uh, mm -hmm. based on what, uh, what is involved, how many people are involved, how big are the teams, what is the strategic positioning of the marketing. And I will say that the differences that are in there are about the concepts because you do need to talk about things in a, you need to talk about different things when people are using the thing versus when they're trying to make a decision whether or not to commit to it. So there are differences. Marketing, um, I am not super skilled at marketing. I've done some marketing work and I am always really relieved when I have a marketing counterpart or counterparts and I can be like, I'm working over here. Can you give me eyes on this to make sure that I'm not going off the rails? And they ask for me like, hey, do you have a minute to look this over? We wanna make sure that people click the button in the marketing email. Yes, things like that. Cool. Um, if any of you that have asked the questions feel like you, know, you wanna have a follow-up question, please feel, feel free to jump in. Um, if not, um, here's a second question um, from Claudia. She's asking us, um, does it make, or asking you, does it make sense to translate the voice and tone um, that has been developed from the brand team into UX? So um, Claudia, please correct me if I'm not understanding this correctly, but you mean like from the, if, if you can use the, the voice that the brand team created and also use it for UX? Or if you need to, to create a different voice there? No, I, I mean, like, if you, if I understand correctly, you have to translate it, like there is from brand voice, they, they have their own uh, voice and tone they develop, but um, for the UX writing, you have to find uh, kind of a translation, right? Yeah, it's sort of like two different versions of the same thing. Like when you have your, or like when I have like, here I am meeting with, several people who I don't know in real life yet. Hi, um, here is like, I'm speaking as a presenter. If you're at my house, I'm gonna show you where the glasses are and invite you to get yourself a drink, right? Like there's going to be differences in the, those concepts that you talk about. And there might even be grammatical differences, um, but it needs to be in the same family, right? It needs to be like, this is not a different, entity um, that I bought into, like the things that people found attractive about it need to be reflected in the language uh, afterwards too. Great question. Thank you. Um, all right, so we also got a few questions about the word count or like the character count for each type of UX copy. Um, also from Claudia, I think um, you asked if, um, if you have like a source or like how you found out how many words or how many characters per per type of, of copy yeah. and if you do have a source like would do you think there's there's the same source for different for other languages such as german <laughs> i do not have a public source this was based on research done inside microsoft um, by the xbox team and by the office team and what was amazing was this research was being done and then we would get these results and then and we really thought, okay, here it is for TV. And then the office team was like, well, here it is for desktop. And we're like, no way, that's amazing. But we kept getting this synchronicity uh, of language. I really, uh, actually one of the motivators for me to write this book was being like, nobody, people coming into the field don't have access to this uh, knowledge that we got from old UX studies inside corporations where even people joining that corporation now, it's like, oh, do I still have a link to that deck where we did the report readout? No, we needed a more, a more common starting place. And I am super happy that there's more books out there, there's more presentations and people are sharing this more widely. But yeah, I, I desperately want this information for other languages. Yeah, I think, uh... We all do, <laughs> but um, we're getting there. I feel like <laughs> we're getting there. Um, okay, here's, there were a couple of questions regarding um, like different languages and cultures. 
Um, Lorena is asking, have you ever had to consider and map how a brand's voice and tone unfolds and applies to different languages and cultures? And then another one which goes in the same direction is like um, uh, Sherry, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Um, so Spanish, for example, is, is spoken in many countries. How do you decide which dialects to use and which cultural references to use? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any tips? <laughs> my, my best tips for uh, being an English speaker working in the US is to make good friends with localization and have good internationalization partners. Because all of these, uh, all of these differences that can be made in English, of course, those differences exist in other languages and in other regions. And of course, it will be read differently. In, um, in Xbox, we worked uh, really closely with, uh, with our translation team. And, and we would get feedback like, we would get feedback from customers and from uh, internal developers being like, why is our Russian so formal? Why? And the UX team was like, is it? Oh, is that why it's this long always? Right, it would just expand every field. So then we were able to work with our internationalization team um, and working with our vendors inside Russia. And they were saying, oh, you're Microsoft. We just thought this is the way you wanted it. Oh no, see, we're in people's living rooms. We're not at work and we need to make that difference. So at Xbox, it was very much, what is the culture of Xbox that we wanna have everywhere, regardless of culture? And then, uh, and then currently working on Google support, I have the opposite problem or opportunity, which is um, we are Google support, but we want to respect where everybody is using Google products seamlessly throughout their lives. So we need to be very careful with, you know, in some regions, and I'm not going to cite any specifics here because I look them up. Um, in some regions, we want to be more uh, overtly sympathetic. And in other regions, we definitely do not because it's seen to be patronizing or, or something like that. So it makes an enormous difference. Um, what, what I do and what the teams I'm aware of do is to write in whatever the first language is of their experience, write that well, and then work with internationalization to get it right elsewhere too. Cool. I love that tip. Coming from Switzerland, we do the same. We have, <laughs> we have somebody for each language always. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So we had a few mentions of your book. A lot of people here have read your book, apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rebecca is asking, uh, in your book, I noticed you didn't include confirmation dialogues uh, in your chapter about applying UX text patterns. Uh, do you consider these a type of notification and or how would you apply UX text patterns to confirmation dialogues? And I think there was a discussion about these confirmation dialogues and um, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Re Rebecca, but you mean these kind of these dialogues that say, do you really want to, to uh, complete this action and then yes or no? Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a chapter on confirmation messages, but those I call like success messages, which are not the same. These are the ones that are asking you if um, you are fully aware of what's going to happen when you make this decision and whether or not you want to continue or cancel. Yeah, I and so I remember we used to call them, are you sure? Mm -hmm, exactly. Let's yeah. put in an are you sure? Mm -hmm. And so here is the secret that I haven't told any groups yet. So really good question. I had it on my list to include and I couldn't come up with a good way. Like it, the are you sure's are evolving, right? So when I was starting out, we used them everywhere. If it was a destructive or committing action and the best way to do them then was just to ask, are you sure? Mm -hmm. And then if we could repeat the verb, we would like, yes, um, yes, do the thing. And then, uh, and so we would start with the, are you sure? But then when I was writing the book a year and a half, two years ago, it was like, wait a minute, we're really moving away from that. And that is a good thing. Like, this is the evolution that happens. 
I kind of look forward to the day when the whole, my whole book is obsolete because nobody would use those patterns anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're in an evolved, evolving state away from them, which is why I didn't include them. Um, when I have to write those now, I start with, are you sure, with the program manager, usually product owner, I start with, are you sure we need to ask? <laughs> right? Because so many times we don't need to ask, right? Like if it's at the end of a multi-step thing and it's not even particularly destructive, like, yes, this person has committed all of these times. Good God, let them just do. Um, then we don't use them nearly as often. But then if we do want to emphasize it, there's often a better way, like um, just to emphasize this is important. Here's why I'm stopping you and adding friction is because of this. So I hope that answers your question. Can I ask a follow-up question? Of course. Um, so I'm just, so why are they, why are we moving away from, are you sure? Why, do you, do you have a theory as to why that's happening? I, my theory is the same reason um, pop-ups are something to be used really sparingly is that people uh, would see the are you sure and immediately just hit yes without reading it yeah. because their heightened brain knew, oh, here is something I just click. So that's my theory. I've got no data to back that up. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, all right. Some of the questions um, that we got are talking about tools. So um, do you have any like go-to tools for measuring if words are low, mid or high usage? Um, and then another question is just asking like, what's the best tool for you to like work with UX writing or as a UX writer? Yeah, so my go-to tool for, for where I do my UX writing work in designs is Figma. I partner with my designers. If they have a file started, great, I partner with them. If they don't have something that has all of the variations I need, I'll even you know, use one of their screens and then use one of the sync from sheets tools to make all the variations I need synced to a spreadsheet that my product owner and my engineer will prefer when they go to do the coding. But that lets me evaluate and change the content um, and really do the designing of the content uh, in the designs themselves. When it comes to word frequency, um, let me let me show you. Um, uh, this corpus of American English is super helpful. The UI is a little bit janky, and it is it is so super useful to use. And you can search for words, you can get frequency of words, um, and you can, uh, it's funny because I have this open in a different thing. So what they've done is they've chosen all of these different sets of language, including like TV and movie descriptions and blogs and academic papers and all this sort of thing. And by using that corpora, I wanna, uh, okay, I'm not going to cloak around much here, but EnglishCorpora.org slash COCA is magical um, for finding words in relative frequency of use for American English. And they've just updated it in 2020. Um, and you can download, I think, the top 5,000, which is all I want to be using. Mm -hmm. um, you can download the top 5,000 for free. So... Thanks, Coca. So kind of um, going in the same direction here is a, a question from Christina. Uh, when you have to decide uh, about the name of a concept, do you have like a process or what is your process? Do you oh, research um, <laughs> what users use or, uh, when all, or how do you research what users use when all you know is the one term in your possibly not native language? Um, yeah. yeah. So um, naming is really one of the hardest problems inside UX writing. I'm, I apologize, I'm losing my voice. We are, we've just hit springtime in Seattle, so things start blooming. It's great. Um, so 
for naming, really the biggest naming problems are interpersonal, like even beyond the, like, first you've got to find words. What could this possibly be? And doing the competitive research, finding out what other people call it, finding out what your users would call that concept is absolutely the most valuable thing you can do. Find out what word they would already use for it um, if they had their preference. But then you have to convince engineers, product owners, executives, um, everybody else who all want a piece of that pie, in my experience. They all want to be involved in that process and they've all got very distinct opinions about it. So um, what I do is I usually go to the processes established by branding. So I, I, or I use branding best practices for uh, companies that don't have a brand team um, and say, okay, what is, uh, what is the realm of things? What do our users say? And then hold in-person sessions with each other or virtual these days where I say, okay, let's come up with all of the ideas we can, even the terrible ones, and then, uh, and then continue forward. It is really tough. Naming is some of the hardest things. I especially liked your example with the, uh, what was it, sign in security and, and pass key and you saying like, you know, out of a designer's perspective and like from the product team, everybody was like, no, that's a no go, but then it, it ended up being the best. I love that example. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was a tough one. <laughs> For sure. I can imagine, especially the line break. <laughs> Right, like, ah, we can't ship that. <laughs> yeah. And then they would yeah. switch over to Chinese and be like, look, no line break, it's ah. fine. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so maybe, I don't know, maybe two more questions. Um, I see like a few questions, three questions talking about error messages. Um, so one, somebody, Pedro is asking, what's the best uh, error message title approach? So state the problem, state the problem or offer a solution in the title. And then, so, um, yeah, maybe let's start with this one, sorry. So I am very much team, if we can get them to a solution, let's do it in the big text right up front. Um, so using that title for the try again or the um, sign in first or whatever they need to do to get where they're going, when that can be done. So if there is no way to get there from here, like, sorry, it's broken, nah, it's not gonna work then telling them that in the title saying and on occasion telling them you're sorry mm -hmm. super important so what was the follow-up part so the follow-up part uh or like just the second question about error messages is how titiana is asking this how do we compromise between the clarity uh, of error messages and like security cons considerations yeah. um yeah um that is so Okay, so for most things, most of the time, our job as UX writers is really to be increasing clarity, right? Like we're gonna make it more usable, we're gonna make it reflect the brand, but clarity is really the thing top of mind for most of us most of the time. But secretly, the most important thing we do is protect the organization's liability from not over-promising, from not creating circumstances where bad actors can take advantage of the system. So for example, there's many cases with uh, credit cards and credit card errors where you don't want to tell the bad guy using the fraudulent credit card number that, hey, that's fraudulent, um, get the hell out. Mm -hmm. What you do want to tell them is, oh, I'm so sorry, that just doesn't seem to be working. Because when it is the bad actor using fraudulent credit cards, you want to take up as much of their time as you can with that one fraudulent credit card without tipping them off to like try a different one. So yeah, um, liability and security as part of liability does override clarity in very specific circumstances. Cool. All right. So hearing your voice, 
<laughs> I feel like I apologize for that. <laughs> no, just, don't worry about it. No, I'm... <laughs> Here, I will um, put up this. Uh, if anybody does want to connect on LinkedIn or uh, schedule time, I make time available on my calendar. So I love meeting people. Uh, we loved meeting you, Tori. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you so, so, so much for, for taking the time today, um, for asking, yeah, for answering all our questions. Yeah, um, we got so much like positive feedback right here in the chat. Like you should, you should read through it because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um so thanks for being here um two more, so i mean two more things from our side before we we break this session up um first of all <laughs> um first of all uh if some people want to stay we're still doing the speed networking thing afterwards um absolutely not mandatory of course as mentioned and second of all, um, our next meetup, we already have two speakers there. Um, it'll be on May the 4th. <laughs> um, that was not on purpose, but it is incidentally on May the 4th. Um, and Natalia and Marta will be speaking about, you know, peer UX writing, how to do UX writing in, in a collaborative setting. Um, yeah, so that should be great topic. We would love, yeah, we should, we would love to see some familiar faces there. Um, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> and, um, may the fourth be with you. Have a great time at your speed networking. Thank you so much, Tori. Thanks again. And, Thanks for um, coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.